All right. I think we're, I think we're good. And we got almost, uh, almost a hundred in. I know we got some more pouring in, but we can go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody, uh, to the webinar that we're doing today. Um, we've got, uh, two companies represented here today, IP architects and IP infusion. And we, uh, we work together often on a lot of projects and we wanted to talk about BNGs and modern network architectures. Uh, we did a webinar previously that was talking about comparison of, uh, uh peering routers and what was happening in, in peering routers and the commodity space and the white box space and what we were doing with design. And that was incredibly successful. We had, a, we had an awesome reaction to that. So this is one of the other topics that we, we'd had requested a lot that we talk about a lot is BNGs and what they look like in a modern network. Because BNGs have been around for quite a long time. Uh, in a minute here, I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit about the history of what we've done with BNGs in the past, where we've been, and where we're headed in the future as we look at white box and commodity network architectures and what the role that BNGs play in that. So, but before we go dive into that, we're going to spend just a couple minutes telling you about uh, the companies involved if, uh, uh, if you're not already familiar with them. So a, a little bit about myself, and then I'll let Vince is on here with me. I'll let him uh, talk about uh, himself. My background is uh, a little bit varied. It's mainly service provider. Uh, I've done some work in the uh, in the enterprise. Um, been working in, in IT for about 25 years now, and in the last decade, I've mainly worked as a consultant and uh, leader of the engineering team at IP Architects. and And our main focus is designing and building commodity solutions. So this is something that I've spent a lot of time uh, doing the uh, this kind of work, doing design of white box and commodity networks. Um, and and Vince has as well. So with that, I'll I'll turn that over to Vince and let him tell you a little bit about himself. Hi, everybody. My name is Vince Shuley. I'm the director of the Partner Infusion Program for Technical Solutions in EMEA in India. And yeah, I came back out of the Department of Defense where I worked, started out with SATCOM networks, and I went into uh, MPLS network service provider style, finally working on coalition networks and NATO networks. And until recently, I uh, worked with IP architects designing ISPs and enterprise data centers. All right, awesome. Thank you for that, Vince. So um, I'll tell you just a little bit about IP Architects. Um, IP Architects originally started out as a consulting company uh, that was doing a lot of work in commodity solutions like Microtik, working with wireless ISPs. And since then, we've grown into a variety of different uh, things that we've worked on. We, um, Even though we're well-known for service provider, we have done some enterprise work. We've worked for a number of Fortune 500s and publicly traded companies because we sit in a neutral space. We're not a VAR. We don't sell hardware or software. We, we just sell our time. And so that's allowed us to be in a unique position to be an advocate for a client on the design that we pick uh, and how, how we want to build that, how the client wants to build that. And in the last 10 years, we've... Uh, Got, gone all over the world as far as projects. Uh, we have offices in Europe. We have offices in South America. Also have offices and our data center in the U.S. And um, you know, at any given time, we're working uh, hundreds of different projects across our team for uh, ISPs, governments, utilities. Uh, you name it. We've we've worked across a bunch of different environments. And so uh, and I'll let you you jump into IP Infusion, Vince. A quick overview of IP Infusion. We're a software company that builds network operating systems. And our uh, OS that you might be familiar with is, is Aknos, which runs on community or commodity hardware, a lot of Broadcom ASICs. And then we also sell control plane products or uh, um, Flex, which is another one of our, our offerings. And we focus in the service provider, data center, and OEM space, and you can see some of the uh, the awards that we've got there on the the right from GigaOM, Telecom Infrastructure, and and ORAN. All right, so on to the good stuff. So one of the things that we thought was important is Vince and I kind of got together to figure out how to tell the story of BNGs and what we do with them today is talking about where they came from and um you know and we always they since i'm the oldest member of the team they always you know give me the joke i was there three thousand years ago when bngs were started um and, and back in the early 2000s um bngs were a really really helpful um they were a really helpful piece to the network puzzle in an isp and and we didn't always call them bngs bng i don't know the exact like 
time when the term came into play. But BNG, if you're not familiar with the term, stands for Broadband Network Gateway. And in general, it's the router or device where you're aggregating subscribers to, and you're applying a lot of complex policies like AAA, radius, shaping. You know, these days, we'll, we'll integrate them into CGNAT gateways. And pretty much everything that happens with a subscriber is going to happen on a BNG. But before we get to that, we'll talk about where BNGs came from, which was really uh, BRAS, which is a broadband remote access server, which came out of the late 80s and 90s in dial-up internet. And interestingly enough, we've kind of kept that framework alive for a very long time and, and morphed it and adapted it over the years. Um, when I first started, we were using platforms like the Cisco 7206 VXR. So for any of you that are on here that were around at that time, when we were using those platforms, you'd count up your bandwidth points on your, uh, um, on your uh, um, control plane engines on the 7206 VXR to be able to pass enough traffic and that was a very, very common BRAS. In its day, it was a great BRAS because uh, it had one of the biggest CPUs um, for the price point in the Cisco lineup at the time. And that's the thing that is you're going to hear us talk about over and over with the BRAS is that, and the BNG is that it's very much about CPU. So as much as we've moved into ASICs and very all the things that we do these days are have been pushed into an ASIC. The one thing that we don't see pushed into an ASIC quite as much, it is out there, but it's not done as, as often, is the BNG. And most of the BNG platforms you'll still see come with pretty hefty CPUs because the tasks of, of shaping and queuing and radius and all the things that you need, especially if you're still going to need PPPoE termination, we'll talk about that in a little bit. All of those things require a lot of overhead in the CPU. And so looking at this when we first did this years ago, those are the platforms that we we look towards, and they were very very expensive. Um, being able to upgrade uh, a BRAS back in in the uh, late '90s, early 2000s was an incredibly expensive proposition, and a lot of times we didn't even have a replacement. We would rely on four hour replacement from TAC if we lost one because it was very very expensive to do that. And I think one of the things that's helpful um, to talk about with that is that originally it was designed to work over multiple layer two types. Today we're very much on an Ethernet world, but back then um, we had, excuse me, we had a bunch of different types of layer two. We had PPP, we had Frame Relay, we had ATM. Uh, there were definitely others, but those were the common ones. And then later on we had Ethernet. And so as DSL became very popular here in the U.S., Australia, uh, certain parts of Eastern Europe, depending on on where you are, um, DSL was very popular, and it still is used today. With is generally based on ATM. And so having a, having a BRAS, which would generally operate over Ethernet, provided an overlay, underlay infrastructure before we even use terms like that to be able to aggregate subscribers over different layer two mediums, different physical mediums, and apply consistent policies to our router so that we could aggregate the subscribers. So eventually we went on to ASICs and there, there are routers and platforms now that can push the BNG traffic into an ASIC. But one of the problems with that is they're uh, they're very 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 expensive still, um, and they're uh, they're vendor specific. There's um, you know we're just now looking at ASIC capabilities. If we look at the commodity silicon landscape, uh, and you look at what's possible in you know things like P4 and Tofino and the highly programmable data planes that are out there, it, we have the tools to do that. And I think we'll probably see more and more you know open BNG solutions that can be pushed into an ASIC coming up in the next decade. Um, but right now, it's it's still very very uh, it's very expensive to do that into an ASIC. Um, so if if you look at the tier two and tier three service provider space, especially and even some tier ones have been doing this, VBNG in the last few years became a very very popular thing. The idea that I'm going to virtualize my BNG and I'm going to run it as a VM or I'm going to run it as a container as part of an architecture that I that I deploy. And so we go all the way back to the CPU that we started with, you know, 25 years ago. Uh, and that's because CPU is inexpensive. And if we look at one of the other factors, uh, if you look at the last few years, it's the chip shortage and availability of hardware is, is you know, it's not the easiest to get ASICs, very specific platforms, but x86 is still pretty available. So all of that in the last you really three to five years, you know, getting accelerated by the pandemic and the chip shortage pushed us heavily into x86 platforms and the rise of a market that we call VBNG now, which uh, uh, there are a ton of vendors that are that are in that market. One of the ones we'll talk about today is NetElastic, which we've deployed 
a, a lot with, and it's a preferred solution for IP architects. And we've done integrations with it into IP infusion based networks, uh, quite a few of them. It's um, you know, it's a lot cheaper per meg to, to be able to deploy those. And now that we have uh, data planes, accelerated data planes in x86 architectures like DBDK, then we can achieve you know 100 gig speeds on an x86 platform at a fraction of the cost of what it costs for a um, uh, of what it costs for an ASIC based platform. And before we move on to this, the next slide, one of the things I want to mention about the economics of it that's really important is. If you look at the growth that's happening in the broadband space right now, there's a lot of money being thrown around for broadband, especially in the US. And one of the most important things for those ISPs is to get the glass in the ground and the radios up in the air to serve as many subscribers as possible. I mean, that's the single biggest goal. You know, getting the right equipment on the endpoint is important, but getting that physical infrastructure out is the most important as it relates to the capital expenditures of most ISPs. So when we have commodity solutions, that allow them to take more of that capital expenditure and put it towards more fiber in the ground or fiber in the air or radios up in the air, then that creates a win for everybody because they're able to serve more subscribers. So one of our focuses in delivering this is not just can we do this or how do we do this, but being able to deliver it at a price point that frees up capital for other things for an ISP. So if we look at subscriber management, this is one of the things that, that BRAS and then BNG really excelled at. Um, because again, um, like I said, when you're trying to tie in a bunch of systems that aren't related to, to uh, um, the, the technical side of the house, like billing um, and authentication and speed enforcement and, and past due bills, you needed to have a solution that could integrate non-technical people into that process. And so we rely on, on Radius to do that and, and AAA. So, I'm oh, sorry, but it's back up one slide. I was, I was going to go just a couple more points on that, if you could, please. Thank you. Um, so, building a box that can handle this solution and handle the subscriber management was very important. And we got that in the early days with, with AAA. But as the data planes evolved and we moved into Ethernet, one of the things that became very challenging was, uh, if you think about the way PPPoE works, there, there are two things that people really liked about PPPoE. And even if you go into Asia, uh, if you go into uh, India, Australia, New Zealand, and, and a lot of the parts of Asia, PPPU is still heavily used. And one of the things that people liked about PPPoE, even though it does have extra overhead and encapsulation, is that it was very, very easy to build an overlay and shape. It was very, very easy to provide security on the layer two domain because there was, there was no DHCP server that you could conflict with. Um, there's very little that you could do in the layer two domain other than just authenticate uh, the PPPoE session against the BRAS and then later in the BNG. So that became that that process of building the subscriber management became very, very popular with PPPoE. When Ethernet came about, it wasn't as easy to move into an Ethernet world because a lot of the RFCs that now extend Ethernet, you know, things like option 82, and some of the things that we can do is we bring it into a BNG didn't exist. They weren't there. Now, you know, if you fast forward from when I know, I think 15 years ago was the first time I tried to get Ethernet working on a BNG on a BRAS, and, and it was okay, but you know, it's a lot better now. So now if we look at moving forward into the BNG and the business problem of how do I stitch together the technical side of the house and the customer service representative that's just looking at a web UI that needs to manage a customer, the BNG can stitch all that together very cleanly now because we moved into an Ethernet world and I can tie together my billing system, DHCP and Radius, and not just DHCP, but DHCP v6, um, PD for going into IPv6 so that we can not just go v4, but go dual stack. Um, and then be able to rate limit on the BNG um, or do shaping, not just you know rate limiting, but if I want to do um, you know some kind of shaping, we can do that at the BNG now. Our queuing and shaping solutions have evolved a lot in the last decade of what's possible on per subscriber shaping going into a BNG um, or a walled garden. And the walled garden is very popular with some ISPs, especially if you want to do self-service. If you want to be able to do, if you want your subscriber to get a pop that says, hey, you forgot to pay your bill, put your credit card in here and we'll be able to pay that right now. Um, that's very popular. That's, that's, a, that's a solution that a lot of ISPs choose to use. So I'll talk a little bit about the mechanics of the access lifecycle. So as we go uh, install this and we have a customer service request, you're going to have somebody on the non-technical team that is going to create the account in the, in the customer in whatever web and billing platform you're using. And that's going to talk to Radius. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, 
this was supposed to be this was supposed to be slouch and slide. So I'm freewheeling a little bit here. But um, as the DTP request comes in, it's going to look at, at radius and see whether or not it's authorized. And if I'm going to assign a specific IP, maybe I want to put a static IP in there and let radius assign that. Or in the case of DHCP v6 PD, maybe I want to put a, a consistent pool out there of like a 56. Um, because I want to keep my prefix delegation consistent to not disrupt the, the subscribers. Um, and that's going to talk to Radius. Radius is going to talk to the billing system. And then the billing system is going to take the CSR input data. And all of that works in a consistent life cycle that at any given moment, if you need to disconnect the subscriber, if you want to change their speed plan, or even if you want to let them change their speed plan, all of those things and have, have self-service, all those things are possible with Radius. But you have to have a BNG that's capable of taking those radius attributes and really complex radius attributes of the advanced business functionality that you want and bringing that in. And again, you know, hearkening back to PPPoE, that's what PPPoE allowed us to do. There were a wealth of radius attributes that were out there. And then it took about, you know, probably took a decade to get those baked into Ethernet and be able to bring those radius attributes into Ethernet. But we have them now. So you can control Ethernet in, in much the same way that you can control PPPoE. And the other thing that's probably worth mentioning is we we haven't always been able to do um, IPOE networking, where we actually can do slash 32 networking in IPv4 without uh, having PPPoE encapsulation tied to it. So with MPLS data planes, which is something that Vince is going to get into, and I'll let him talk about IPOE a little bit more in technical detail. But as it relates to the billing integration and the billing problem, that's one of the single biggest things that transitioning to a BNG with IPOE capabilities allowed us to do was retain that efficient subnetting uh, style of slash 32 for IPv4 like PPPoE, but do it in a modern BNG platform. So that's one of the reasons we wanted to show this is it's really important to have that tight integration of AAA and business side and technical side. Uh, and uh, Kevin, you hit on it a little bit, but... I do want to bring up a couple of popular DHCP options that people use to help with having consistent authentication of you know option 82 insertion so that you can use that for for the username so you know you know who is is who even if they bring their own their own gear or option 37 on uh, DHCP v6 so that you can kind of start to standardize that and look at it from a more holistic you know how do I make this uh, simple and deterministic perspective? Yeah, exactly. And the deterministic part is key because I think that's one of the things we're seeing, especially IPv6 is where I spend a lot of my time. And being able to be deterministic in IPv6 is incredibly important um, because keeping the same delegation, delegated prefix to your subscribers keeps them happy and it keeps things working very smoothly in IPv6. And that's, that's something you'll hear us talk about again and again is being deterministic with IPv6 prefix delegation. So we've talked about it just a little bit, but the other thing that the BNG allows you to do because it's being built as an overlay, if you think back to the PPPoE analogy that we used, one of the things about um, using the BNG in the overlay, and I don't want to jump too far ahead into Vince's you know, MPLS deep dive, but moving to an MPLS data plane is something that allows us to, to do all of these tricks in the BNG because it gives us a flexible data plane that we can encapsulate whatever we want. If you want to, if you want a really great video to go watch, um, uh, go look at Russ's white series on history of networking and go read the history of MPLS by Ross Callen. It's one of the best 45 minutes of, of like, why did MPLS come into being? What technical problem did it solve? It's one of my favorite episodes to go watch on why we did what we did. And the concept of MPLS came about in the late eighties because they needed an, an encapsulation type that they could hardware accelerate. Uh, without worrying about what transport was underneath, whether it was ATM, Ethernet, frame relay, whatever. And so they basically built a common abstraction layer that could be hardware accelerated. And now fast forward to today, and we use it everywhere. And we've moved into SR MPLS away from LDP-based MPLS. Even though a lot of people are running LDP-based MPLS, we're definitely going through a fundamental protocol shift. And one of the things that allows us to do is the is in the efficiency of subnetting with the BNG. And I already talked a little bit about IPOE and how we can do efficient slash 32 subnetting like PPPoE on a BNG. But it also means that we can rapidly deploy IPv6. Um, now, you know, I, I love IPv6. I'd love to see IPv6 routed into the underlay to, to everywhere. And we're even building some IPv6 only networks as part of the underlay and the MPLS underlay. 
But if you want to get IPv6 to your subscribers as rapidly as possible, and you already have a BNG style network where you're bringing an MPLS overlay, whether it's VPLS, whether it's you know um, L2 VPN and EVPN, whatever that is, um, and in a few networks, it's even VXLAN. Uh, it's not as common, but we've seen it in a few. Um, if you're bringing that L2 overlay back to the BRAS, then you can rapidly deploy IPv6 out to subscribers. And that works really, really well. And that gives you time to go back and retrofit the rest of your network for IPv6 underlays, IPv6 management, and things like that. But you're going to get your subscribers on dual stack to be able to combat the IPv4 exhaustion problem that we're having so that you're not subjecting your know, users to any more NAT than's necessary if you don't have enough public IPv4 space. So that's one of the things that we're seeing that it, the BNG is, is really, really helpful for is that rapid deployment of v4 and v6 together by leveraging that mpls data plane and also the other thing i'll note is pppoe um the bng style allows pppoe integration and migration like very very easily so if you're running a bng you have the ability to keep pppoe subscribers if you're moving off of pppoe and move those ips that they've had if they have a static ip it's a slash 32 and pppoe if you have a bng you can move that to ipoe pretty easily and so you can go through a fundamental protocol shift without really affecting your subscribers, um, which is one of the other things that the abstraction that a BNG provides makes it really, really nice um, because it, it's a seamless transition for uh, subscribers. And Kevin, I want to hit on this a little bit as well. So one of the things when you you mentioned it a little earlier about CGNet was um, you know having CGNet gateways. Traditionally, those are very expensive. You have to spend a bunch of money on them. They kind of become cross prohibitive. So especially at higher throughput, so you would do things like run a layer three VPN for a CG NAT so you could, and then try to leak V6 back into the global table. But that starts to become a little challenging on what's supported on the actual uh, routers that are out in the field. So if you use an, an overlay back to a VBNG, especially, you know, something like Net Elastic Solution, I'll speak to theirs because I've done this, uh, you know, when I was over with, with IPA, you, you can run um, CG net and BNG on the same box, and then you can run IPv6 on it. And because of the uh, the value of and the cost savings and performance of that, you don't really have to worry about playing some of those tricks and equipment dependencies out further into the last mile because it's not a huge um, cost on that that CG net application as well. So just to disambiguate what you were talking about, Vince, I think what you were what you were characterizing is if I'm routing my subnets to the last mile versus using an overlay with a BNG and I have dual stack with V4 and V6, getting the V4 traffic through the through the CG NAT gateway requires some verf tricks to separate V4 and V6 so that you're not burning up those speed licenses on your CG NAT gateways with IPv6 traffic. If you're if you're route if you're just straight routing to the last mile, whereas if it's an overlay with a BNG, you bypass all of that and funnel it together so that you're not playing those tricks. Just to kind of yeah, exactly. distinguish between the two solutions, right? Yep, you hit it. Cool. So now uh, I'm gonna give Kevin a little break here from from talking and and talk about some of the options of how do you get back to the BNG? You know, Kevin talked about it from uh, the days when, when he had hair, right. Of, uh, you know, some of the things frame Wasn't relay, ATM, uh, but even today you still see a lot of people that are running STP and they're looking to get out of that. Maybe they went to, uh, to ERPS G8032 because of the fast failure failover. It's, it's traditionally been pretty cheap, but you kind of hit some limitations there in terms of, what you can steer, how you deploy it. Uh, you know, once you get more rings and more sub rings, it starts to become a little complicated. And then you really have to have people that have been ingrained for a long time and it becomes operationally intensive. So then as uh, more commodity ASICs in the DNX family, so like Qumran um, started coming out, it lowered the cost to MPLS. So, and then with feature sets, so people started being able to deploy um, MPLS for kind of the same cost as as ERPs. It it gave a lot of um, a lot of different options on flexibility in that transport layer in the last mile. So now you can run LDP or RSVP TE. You can get more than just an east and a west out and deployment. You know you might be able to put one stub out and you're just adding more routed links and so. You, 
traditionally you could do this with LDP, RSVP, TE, get fast reroute, you know, VPWS, VPLS, EVPN. Now, um, kind of the gold standard is SRMPLS, and that comes with a lot of benefits of you can still get uh, the same fast reroute capabilities that you would get out of ERPS or RSVP TE. You actually get a little bit better coverage with TI LFA than you would with uh, um, remote LFA or just traditional LFA. And then you can also interwork that back with your LDP network if you need to so that you can tie all this back in. And at the end of this, we'll show uh, a picture of what this topology looks like. And Kevin and I will discuss it a little bit and some of the benefits of what you get here and how it simplifies deployment, makes it easy and consistent for your operations team to go and deploy. And uh, another thing about SRMPLS is you move that signaling down into the IGP. So now you only have to maintain ISIS or OSPF. You don't have to maintain LDP as well, or you don't need to maintain all the state that goes along with RSVP. TE. So even traffic engineering becomes uh, simplified because you do everything at the source router. So it, it becomes the source router that uh, determines the, the path that you're going to take. And you can hit all your same traditional um, layer two overlays, which allow for that transport back. Anything else you want to add here, Kevin, before we go to the next slide? No, I think you covered it. The only the only thing that I would add is that I think we've uh, ever since SRMPLS has come out, we've started to really see an uptick in the adoption of SRMPLS. Um, in I'd say the last maybe three to four years, um, even in enterprise, we're starting to see enterprise underlays and data centers, you know, go from VXLAN and the data plane to SRMPLS and the data plane. So I, I think we've seen a pretty pretty rapid shift and push. Towards SRM or MPLS, we'll be an LDP, you know, based world for quite a while. Um, but I would say in another five years, I think we'll see more MPLS solutions in SRMPLS than we will in LDP, if I were to call it. Yeah, and I will since you hit on this a little bit. It's not on the slide here because in service providers, a lot of the times MPLS is um, a preferred data plane. But there is, you know, VXLAN. With EVPN is another way if you only have IP transport and you don't have uh, MPLS in the core or last mile, it is another way that you can get a layer two overlay. Um, so that's that is an option, and then you know, that works with EVPN as as an overlay and a VXLAN data plane only. Uh, you just need IP reachability. So I hit on a few of these things already on the previous slide, but when you start to, one of the things that um, used to see a lot was people were starting to move from ERPS to SRMPLS. And a lot of this had to do with the rings had gotten really complex, uh, how they were tied together and started to take a long time to deploy new sites. And, you know, there was only the one person there who had been working at the company for, you know, insert number of years and it you know, new sites became challenging. So then as we talked about going towards SRMPLS, you can get that same resiliency. And I would say you can actually get some improved resiliency because now you don't just have east-west options. If you need to, you can add a third uh, routed link out. You can add a fourth, you know, it, all depends on what you have for fiber. So you can really start to get more interconnection. And then you still have the fast reroute uh, options and you can reroute around those failures with the same sort of performance that you would see out of a traditional ERPS. And once you have the, um, with SR MPLS, you can have some TE options. You can have manual policies, uh, egress peer engineering, PCA, on-demand tunnels, right? So, so there's various more ways that you can steer your traffic around the network if that's something that you that you need. And you know, you'll have to have the use case that supports the uh, added complexity of of maintaining those tunnels, but you do now have that that option. And this really all became sort of possible, like Kevin was talking about, with when MPLS started you know, the DNX, the Qumran based 
platforms started having uh, better support, the cost and cost per port started coming down so you could get a lot of value out of it. So you could take advantage of some of these um, these capabilities that were not available you know in the past right when when Kevin started started networking even a few years ago on on white box it was mostly trident based and you know anybody that's tried to run MPLS on on trident 2 has kind of seen the challenges it's possible and but now with with Qumran um, it works you know Qumran Qumran 2 Jericho um, start getting into those those different chipsets that are you know more router chips now you can can really take advantage of of the value uh, that that comes from commodity networking. And the other thing I'd like to jump in and add to the two events that is, especially for service providers, if you're a last mile service provider, one of the other things that's really nice about having an MPLS network is there there are times when you need non Ethernet based capabilities. Um, if you need to be able to deliver TDM uh, for like you know an elevator or an alarm system. Uh, industrial networking and utilities often like still leverage TDM based solutions. So while you can do that with a VLAN and ERPs, it's, it gets really, really hard to continue to drag VLANs all around the rings or the multiple sub rings and things like that. And that was one of the original use cases of MPLS. So being able to put a pair of endpoints, you know, if you still need a, you know, if you need a PRI or a T1, I know that sounds archaic, but there's still a lot of, if you're a telco or you're a WISP or FISP and you're serving a market that, you know, you have, you know, industries and, and companies that have those needs, you know, having that flexible data plane to put whatever you need on it, you know, even if it's something besides Ethernet just makes it a lot easier um, to solve it in a much more elegant way than just to keep, you know, carving VLANs, you know, crisscrossed all over the place, because eventually you're going to end up with a mess um, when you're when you're doing it in in ERPs. And that's what we I first deployed ERPs. Um, on uh, I think it was on Adtran gear like 15 years ago. It was like one of the very first ERPS rings in this part of the country that we put out, and it was great at the time, and it's still great in very specific applications. But you know, very clearly, SRMPLS is you know is is taking over as the last mile protocol of choice. So, um, you know, I'm gonna hand this back over to Kevin here to introduce his his validated design. Um, yeah, so. One of the things that we put together, we started putting together and we started working on with ISPs was how do we build commodity solutions that are going to work as well as the major vendor counterparts that are going to have the same SLA running the same protocol stacks and and stitch all that together into a cohesive strategy that works. And this is something we've spent a lot of time at. We've been, uh, I think we've been working with IP Infusion for I think seven, eight years, something like that, maybe nine years, right at the really the dawn of white box and and disaggregation as it first started to becoming a buzzword in the industry, we started working on these solutions. And as things have matured in the ASICs and the, the capabilities of the software and the boxes over the years, we've started to put together uh, an architecture that allows us to build all of these things. Um, now that we have different port densities, different sizes, uh, the ability to do uh, DC powered equipment, you know, putting it into a relay rack or a cabinet. Um, that's one of the biggest fundamental shifts that we've seen that we've been able to do that that allows us to build this design that you're seeing that faces the RF last mile and fiber to the home is there are boxes now I can go throw in a cabinet um, that, you know, that are very price competitive with their Metro Ethernet counterparts. Um, and, and that used to be the big holdup for us in, in trying to figure out this kind of a design was putting an MPLS enabled node in a cabinet. Uh, or at a tower was, you know, it was just cost prohibitive. So as as we built this out, we realized that uh, if you look at the center, which is IP infusion based, one of the biggest advantages of using Ocnos and IP infusion that we have found and and pairing it with commodity hardware is that transport. If you look at a major vendor and you go look at transport between wherever your peering location is and your core and the last mile, or even if it's multiple peering locations. That got really expensive because you need there's several things that you needed. You needed boxes that had enough port density so that especially if you're running your own fiber, you want to connect that at as high a speed as is economically possible so that you get the longest life cycle for the network that you can. Um, you want to have advanced you know shaping capabilities. Um, if you're covering a larger area and you get into 100 gig and 400 gig, you have to have some shaping capabilities at a certain latency point to be able to pass the traffic properly. So you need something that is not just a you know, shallow buffer box, like a data center box, which is 
in the early days of white box, that's what we started with. We had very shallow buffers, data center style boxes, and they worked for some ISPs, but it took us a while until, like Vince mentioned, they came out with the Qumran and Jericho that had much deeper buffer capabilities before we could build a service provider core that would be uh, you know, pound for pound more like the major vendor counterparts. So that's what we have here. Today, we can go take a 1U platform, whether it's from a vendor like EdgeCore or Eufy Space um, or, or any of the other ones that are out there. There's a number of other ones out there, but those are the two that we mainly work with are EdgeCore and Eufy Space. And in those nodes that you see as layer three switch icons, we can put those out there and build 100 gig or multi 100 gig transport at a fraction of the cost of even just one line cart from a chassis in a major vendor. So, you know, going back to my point, the whole idea of this is if we can get that protocol stack between those towers and those OLTs and ONTs and the cabinets in the last mile and the peering point in the data center at a fraction of the cost, then I'm putting up more towers, I'm putting up more radios in the air. Um, shout out to all my WISP friends that are on there. I saw a few of you on there. So if you're in fixed wireless broadband, you're putting radios up in the air. This lets you put more infrastructure into towers. If you're doing fiber, which some WISPs are, or if you're a telco or you know some other kind of provider and you want to put fiber out, you're putting more fiber out because you can take all that money and put it towards this and you're still going to get the same SLA. This is, you know, we put this into even countrywide environments. I think there's been at least two national ISP projects in South America and Africa that I've been involved with that we built like countrywide transport on this. So, you know, we're, we're talking about something that has, you know, been tested at scale and works really well. So as you, as you go through the transport part of the design, which is the shaded IP infusion part there, where we're using an SRM PLS data plane to connect everything in the last mile to the core where the BNG is, you'll notice you've got a couple different protocol things happening here, which I'm gonna let Vince deep dive into. But in general, this is designed to show the mix of the old and the new. Because if even if you were PPPoE based, most of us used VPLS once we moved to a uh, to an MPLS data plane. You know, even you know, even almost two decades ago, we were doing uh, you know EOMPLS, XConnect, VPLS. Later on, VPLS to be able to connect the last mile locations to the BRAS. And today, it's very much the same thing. We'll use VPLS in a set of aggregation routers connected into the data center, and then be able to hand it off ultimately to those BNGs you see down there. And But these days, now that we're moving over to eVPN and L2VPN, there's a way to kind of stitch both of those together. And that's one of the other really, really complex tasks that you would otherwise need a major vendor to go do is doing stitching of LDP and segment routing together. And so with that, I'm going to hand it off to Vince to talk about that a little bit. He's put it into prod, I think, uh, the most of anybody I know from between IP and Fusion and, and NetElastic and talk about you know what the impact of that is and how that works. Yeah, so I want to hit on a few things here. When we start to go with the MPLS underlay, as you kind of see on the uh, left-hand side of the diagram here, now we can standardize. It doesn't really matter whether you're RF last mile, fiber of the home last mile. You're just you're just aggregating services, right? And you're going to dump that in layer two. And the layer two overlay technology, you know, eVPN over SRMPLS is... is uh, one of my favorites for a lot of reasons. As you put that in, now you can bring that back to the core and you're just transporting the DHCP request, which hits the VBNG. Now the VBNG has to do all of the business processes, right? So earlier on, we talked about how it sends those radius requests back to authenticate it. All of that gets passed transparently over the layer two overlay so that now you have that layer two network where you have the capabilities of MPLS uh, that when it comes to fast reroute or traffic engineering, or if you need those, and you also have the business problem solved of how do I authenticate and shape my subscribers so that they get the speed package that they're paying for, right? So now you tie those two together in, the com in, a, in a complete solution with LDP only is certainly still an option, and you can do active passive pseudo wires for uplinks for has, uh, high availability. Something that you can do with high availability with eVPN is um, multi homing. So you can run uh, eVPN multi homing up to the VBNGs, and then you're able to go and provide that layer two outlet from two. Uh, from two PEs, right? So the two in the middle. And 
Likewise, due to the cost, if you have some major sites where your OLTs, you really want them to, to stay up, uh, you have a lot of uplinks, you might be able to put two um, aggregation switches or you, know, you might hear, hear them talk about a CSRs on the product portfolios from the OEMs. If That's because they have timing capabilities as well, if that's something that you need. But you can start to put those out in the cabinet and run EVPN multi-homing in the cabinet. So now you have resilient layer two all the way from the cabinet back to the core. And you can take down boxes to do upgrades, put them back in service. You can really start to make your operations um, quite a bit easier. And you see a pair here because you can run active-active, uh, active-passive on NetElastic's uh, setup. So you can be able to, to do that. And then the secondary or one of the things that always sort of comes up when we start talking about, well, how do I get to SRMPLS is, well, I have this big LDP network and I can't forklift it overnight. Okay, that's that's fine, right? What you do is you run an LDP SR mapping server and that maps and stitches the labels together between the SR domain and the LDP domain. So you can have an end-to-end -end labeled switch path. And you might've seen a couple of press releases from us recently in regards to deployments with um, Amplex and Metalink. Those are both running, uh, you know, set up similar to this where you take advantage of LDP mapping servers and you interwork the, the LDP domain and the SR domain so that you can have that end-to-end -end LSP and deliver that layer two service that that you need to from your LDP portion of the network back into the SR portion. And um, same thing, if that portion of the network doesn't support eVPN, then you can run traditional uh, LDP-based VPLS or BGP-based VPLS to bring that back in and pass the layer two traffic back up to the, uh, to the BNGs. So, Kevin, what did uh what did I miss there? Oh, Sorry. I have a whole list for you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, there are a couple there are a couple points I wanted to come back to though, because I think you you raised some really great points. And um, there's I'll tell the first easy one because the second one's gonna be a little more technical. But one of the things I want to highlight that I think was important about what you mentioned about uh, Amplex and and MetaLink, which are the two ISPs that you know we had press releases with about architecting this solution. I think one of the most important points to mention about that is one of the things that made this solution viable is that you know previously i think when we were in the design process we were looking at major vendors to do this and it was going to be almost cost prohibitive to do the same thing is it fair to say that the design that we would have rolled with if we'd used a major vendor would have changed the way the protocol architecture just because you know because of cost and availability of hardware that we would have ended up with a completely different design and probably an inferior design to what we ended up with in the commodity space yeah you know i i think that's probably accurate. You probably have to go start to go back to some of those, uh, you know, protocols that we talked about before. So you're going to be back to traditional LDP. You're going to be back to ERPs. You're going to be back to, you know, standard layer two um, segments to be able to deploy the same sort of resiliency that you might might get when you're going with SRMPLS or, you know, you might try to home run everything back. Your amount of Interconnection in the last mile will, you know, be limited by um, number of east-west ports, right? So it it starts to change how you think about the entire architecture and end uh, from that design aspect. That makes sense. All right, so here's my second point. So one of the things that you and I have had a lot of conversations about this, but I'm going to go ahead and ask you this this question, even though I think I know the answer. Um, to put you on the spot. Let's talk about uh, EVPN multi-homing and VPLS and why that's harder or in some cases not even possible reliably with VPLS and how EVPN multi-homing, like what problem is it actually solving? What is VP, where is VPLS lacking there? And explain it to me like I'm five. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not, I'm not chat GPT, so I don't know if I'll <laughs> be able to explain it to you like you're five. That's good. Okay. So, there's always this debate about multi-chassis lag versus stacking versus et cetera. You know, how do you get that resiliency within the core of the network on the layer two uplinks to wherever you're going to go routing out towards your peering edge? And 
Uh, a lot of times it was multi-chassis leg, and then you have active and passive pseudo wires, and you have to determine whether or not you know which one is active. And it, I think it was you that told me the joke of you know trying to determine when you have a multi-chassis leg uh, active active forward in pair which one it is forward in. It depends on how you drove into the driveway that day at work and you know where the sun is in the sky. Sounds about right. Uh, so, so you can start to bring that, uh, the proprietary multi-chassis lag out of, per, um, out of play and move over to a standard base solution with EVPN multi-homing to get the same layer two uplinks of, you know, I have two boxes that are in the same layer two domain they're in the same LACP channel. Uh, with multi-homing, you you can actually go to more than two boxes if you if you want. So you know, maybe you need you have four P's that are uh, are connected. Then that uh, that gives you a little bit of flexibility because it's it's uh, EVPN. It's MLAG and BGP, right? So mixed together. We, we moved MLAG from a proprietary solution up into a control plane of BGP and said, okay, now we have multi-homing. And we're so, letting the control plane in BGP manage the loop prevention in the way that the yeah, data so plane is forwarding Ethernet, those frames. Uh, segment identifiers and designated forwarders that determine you know, which box is going to be forwarding and which part, which boxes are part of the uh, lag group. So when you go back to like VPLS and you start to have individual layer two segments coming out. Now, when you have two, you have VPLS multi-home. So you have two uh, attachment circuits, one from each box to the same CE. There's no loop prevention there. So you have to turn on loop prevention either by running span entry, keeping one of the pseudo wires down, relying on some proprietary uh, methodology to to keep it down, you know, maybe some split horizon rules, right? So you have to take into account the loop prevention a lot more on the planning aspect to make sure that if I have this dual home CE, then in which in this case would be the uh, the VB and G, I don't loop the traffic back into the same layer two domain or that same pseudo wire. So if you overlook that in your planning and then Oh yeah, I go turn this on, and I have this the same pseudo wire on two boxes going into the same PE. Um, it's not going to be a fun night troubleshooting it, right? You're you're gonna have you're gonna have a layer two loop. You're gonna wonder what why everything's looping, and you're gonna have to go and and figure that out. Where you can do that dual attachment of the CA to two PEs, um, kind of out of the box with the EVPN multi homing Got it. So to wrap that up, v VPLS is, you know, there's increased complexity, there's increased fragility because of the number of solutions that you've got to deploy to manage loop prevention in a VPLS world. And when you deploy it in EVPN multi-homing, that's all, all my, my favorite term, automagically, you know, gets handled by BGP because it's, it's, our, it's baked into the control plane. It's designed specifically to solve that problem of, I want to terminate this layer two overlay in more than one location, and I don't want to loop the, the, the traffic in the same VLAN by attaching it in multiple places. So now we have a protocol that just manages that, and you can terminate, you know, any number of layer two overlays, you know, any number of different VLANs on the same, you know, collection of BNGs without worrying about um, uh, um, or aggregation routers without worrying about looping traffic. Oh, and you hit on something kind of important there with you know multiple VLANs, right? So something that's popular is interworking VLANs to be able to aggregate, you know, interwork, take your VLANs, standardize them in the core at the BNG so that you can have the same access VLANs across, you know, all your sites for. Right. For, so if uh, I want, if I want voice data and video to be VLAN 101, 102, and 103 at every single tower and fiber to the home cabinet, and I always want to rinse and repeat those same three VLANs, I can interwork those back at the BNG through VLAN translation. Yeah. So coming out, you would have to write, you know, coming out of the attachment circuit, you rewrite or change the VLAN tags. So, you know, you have an outer tag that says, hey, yeah, this one is 
this subset of towers for this geographic region or however you know these are fiber to the home customers and these are fixed wireless access customers however you want to break that up based off your your business process right, right? which if i look at this as an architect that that's money to me because my if i'm rolling text into the field they don't need to go look at netbox to know which vlan they need right they don't need to know which you know they all they all the techs need to know is i'm always going to use vlan 101 102 and 103 at this tower at this fiber to the home cabinet site and then that's you know that's that's more successful truck rolls you know that's fewer truck rolls to solve a problem that's you know getting more truck rolls in to to light up more subscribers because i've i've got a simplification you know of the network design that i'm building in by abstracting that complexity you know again towards the bng which is another i think that's a recurring theme you see here is that we abstract a lot of complexity into like very key devices so that the rest of the network can be less complicated yeah, I think that's great. And, you know, we're coming up uh, kind of at the top of the hour here. So yeah, uh, I don't have too much more to add to to this portion. I think we're well. Let's, uh, let's a little let's over the, the... Yeah, I know we're a little over. Let's talk about an elastic just a little bit, because one of the things that you know, we've talked a lot about the transport architecture and the solution, but, you know, let's talk just a few minutes on looking at net elastic you know net elastic i think came to us as a vbng for uh it started with some of our wisp uh clients that we were working with that were building hybrid wisp and fisp and wanted to use that and i think you know when we first started we were working on like 10 gig solutions and i think now you know we've gotten it up to like you know 100 gig solutions mpls enabled data plane i think we're what we're mixing cg nat in you know right there on the on the vbng and and to me one of the most important parts of that then uh, this is true of uh, almost any vbng was that you know because net elastic was x86 based we were able to go get a server you know either new or even off of ebay you know the height of the chip shortage if we had to and be able to deploy a bng you know not only much more rapidly than we would have a, a you know a vendor based solution um it was far less expensive um and it was more available so you know why don't we talk for a few minutes about that and the actual bng piece you know that we were doing with x86 and, and net elastic because i think that is the last piece of the puzzle that fits into the MPLS transport architecture. Yeah, so you know, I'm going to draw back on my my implementation days when I was was over with with you wearing wearing the orange shirt, right? So when we would get these um, virtual BNGs, right, a lot of times you were starting to compare kind of three a few different tiers, right? You were looking at line cards and traditional vendors, or you were looking at uh, you know. Can I turn Microtech into a BNG on uh, on that setup? And then what's in the middle, right? So there's there's always got to be that that option of you know what's available, what's what works well, and that's kind of where I think I saw Net Elastic come in and and fill that. You know, you could get it; it worked well. It had the subscriber management features that you needed to to solve those business problems, and they had you know the radius integration. So you can start to bring in, you know, they had a good support for radius attributes. So you, as long as you hit that, uh, you know, could get that layer two transport back to them, then you could hit, uh, you could hit the billing system and the radius server to authenticate your subscribers, manage their speeds, do CGNAT if you need to, do IPv6 uh, prefix delegation. So and do that all in the same. The same boxes and then you just route out of that upstream right so once it's once it's authenticated they have internet you know, you know they subscribers paid their bills uh now it just routes out and the bng kind of solves all of those those business problems and i don't have to come up with uh really complicated solutions uh on you know, if i configure these hierarchical cues on my ASIC, I'm going to hit this limitation on this ASIC, and that changes based off which uh, chip I'm using. You know, it's all just standardized. It's part of the CPU. So if it gets there, it hits the CPU, it does that. However, they uh, work it on the back end. You know, um, maybe next time we invite somebody from, from NetElastic to sort of answer those questions. I'm sure uh, for a technical deep dive there, Somebody, Wei Xiao or Tom, you know, I'm gonna put you on the spot if you're in the chat. They'd love the to, to, you know, people would talk to you about that. 
Um, do a VBNG part two. Yeah. So, so it just sort of starts to solve a lot of uh, challenging problems. And you kind of went about this in the beginning of the, in your history lesson, lesson with ASICs of, you know, you're limited by what the capability of the ASIC is and on how many queues you can have, how deep you can stack it, what, you know, buffer, uh, buffer depth. So now you have to start to add a lot more complexity, not only into the config, but also the hardware to make sure that, yeah, this works. And okay, I hit, you know, 8,001 subscribers. Now, I need a new box. Not, now I need another box, right? You know, and I I hit this recently, and um, it was up in Alaska. We were working with an ISP where we had limited we had limited cabinet space, we had limited power options, and we were trying to use something in a BNG role, and the ASIC didn't support it. So even though it solved every other problem, you know, and what we needed, um, you know, we weren't able to do that. So it, you know, being able to bring you know a lightweight virtualized solution. Um, you know, into something because we already had an we already had an x86 virtualization stack that was built into our design um, for the network. So, like being able to bring a virtualized solution like into it like that, and, and like you said, the flexibility of of x86 means that, especially if I'm in an ISP where physical space is at a premium or is you know is challenging, you know, that, especially if you've dropped a ton of money because the BNG licenses are not cheap from the major vendors. I know, like they're. When we got, I think a Cisco 70, um, not a 7206, but a 7201, which was a 1U box back in the like, I don't know, like the 2009, 2010, something like that. It's like a 30 or $40,000 box to aggregate 10,000 subs for a telco, you know, and that's, and it's only gone way, way north from there. So it's, you know, the cost of BNG is, you know, until we had VBNG and commodity solutions never really came down. It just got insanely expensive. So it, it you know, that's, I, that to me, that's where the value of the, of the x86 is. You know, flexibility of platform, flexibility of environment, flexibility, especially in, in in pricing, that it is far more price competitive than anything out there, makes it a a huge win. And and functionality wise, you know, it it's great. We've had a lot of success with uh, with Net Elastic as a VBNG across a, a wide variety of you know Wisp, Fisp, Telco, and other you know type customers. All right, Vince, we're right on the hour. Any other any other any other things that we wanna we wanna slide in before we wrap? No, I don't I don't think so. You know, uh, I know we didn't unfortunately our, our MC had some power issues, so we didn't monitor the chat very well. Uh let's see, look through there quick yep. and see if there was talk through a few things. Slides slides were a question that was asked. Slides will when we send this out in social media, slides will get PDF'd and attached. So anybody that's asking about slides, uh, we'll get that. Other question I saw was recording. Um, you know, can we get a recording of it? Same deal when we release this on social media. The video recording of the entire uh, webinar will go out along with the slides. Um, so you'll have access to all that content once this gets published. You know, uh, here should be within the next few days that this goes live and gets published. I don't think. I think those are the two main questions that I saw in the uh, that I saw in the chat. Um. Oh, so can somebody once per, I'll ask the, uh, try to answer this question as best I can real quick. Someone talked about. Um, can you speak to the differences between applying shaping and policing on the BNG as directly on the OLT? So I can I can speak to that one. I'm I'm probably not the world's best queuing and shaping guy. Um, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Um, no, I've done it. I've done it a number of times. I've done it on the OLT. You know, I've done it across pretty much every OLT vendor that's out there because we work with all of them. The main thing is that you're going to find is, is number one, if you look at the automation of systems, how many automation touch points do you want as you grow? Do you, If I'm going to have four BNGs aggregating like tens of thousands of subs, or even if you're smaller, even if you're, you know, even if you're smaller than that, do you, and you want to build automation into your radius and how you're doing shaping and policing on an OLT, do you want to have to touch every OLT to like go make that change? Or do you want to be able to do that shaping and policing in one place. And so what we've seen as we worked with queuing and shaping systems that are centralized in a BNG, or if we're doing like QOE shaping centralization, it makes it a lot easier to, um, it makes it a lot easier to automate that. And the other thing is that you, you do have to deal with buffer depth. So an OLT is really designed for the ones that do shape. They don't have very deep buffers usually. Um, most of them are designed more for policing. And the problem you run into with that is, 
is if you don't have advanced shaping capabilities, then it, the subscriber experience is not going to be as great. Like, sure, you can keep them from overrunning their limit. If you're selling them 100 meg symmetric, then yeah, you can keep them from running over 100 symmetric, you know, by just relying on, on TCP, you know, to hammer them when they reach their limit. Um, and it's going to back off and it's going to retry. But the problem is they're not going to get the greatest experience in their streaming media, in their gaming and all of that, because everything is, you know, is, is just, you know, competing. If you apply solutions like, you know, QOE, and then you have shaping at a BNG, it's going to be a much smoother experience for the subscriber versus straight policing. And most of the OLTs don't have shaping capabilities. And if they do, they're minimal. So that's the beauty of x86 is if you want deep buffers, if you want advanced shaping capabilities, you just keep buying more x86 because it's flexible. You can do whatever you want with it. You just have to have, you know, more boxes if you want to use, you know, deeper capabilities that require more processing power. So to me, that's that's the advantages. Shaping is always going to be a better uh, subscriber experience. And you can centralize that with fewer touch points versus doing it out at the OLT. I hope that answers your question. I think that was the only other major uh, major technical question that I saw in there. So I think we're probably good to wrap, Vince. Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, thanks for, for joining. I think IP Architects will get this uh, recording posted and send yep. it out uh, so you guys can come back and view it again or anybody that missed the missed the uh live show yep yeah we'll thanks have for that joining out, uh, us today shortly thanks everybody and the uh, links if you look on the screen these are going to go out uh the links to the two vendors that we referenced today in addition to uh, ip architects you know if you want to talk to us you can reach out at consulting at ip architects it's also on our website um and also the reference vendors ipinfusion.com is on there you can go check out ip uh, ip infusion software solutions and the hardware partners that they work with for uh switches and platforms and then netelastic.com is the the vbng solution that we referenced and talked about and then again you'll have both of these in the uh in the pdfs and in the video that we distribute out so you know go check those out hit us up on social media if you want to continue the conversation if you have questions um i'm out on twitter at stubberry 51 um that's where i spend a lot of my time also on linkedin um and uh, Vince is too. I think Vince is out on. Uh, he's out on Twitter as well. Um, is it what's your what's your Twitter hash uh, handle, Vince? Uh, at Shuley twenty two. Okay. Yeah. And cool. Find so, me on LinkedIn. Hit us up with any questions you have, and we'll be happy to continue the conversation. And uh, just thanks to everybody for for tuning in and listening. We had a great attendance, um, and and it was fantastic to have all of you uh, join in and listen. So have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>